Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Um, in Philippians 3, verse 7, it goes that, uh, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus and my Lord, for whose sake I have, have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. We, we, we're here this morning for a transference of the Bible. It's, it's not just information, it's doctrine. It goes from one generation to another. How is it passed? By hearing, but also by, by experiencing. To experiencing the truth of God, the love of God, to know who you are in Christ, the relationship that we have through the Word of God. Uh, your deficit becomes a tool for God to be used. Your, your availability your, abil your availability for, is, is what God is looking for. Not your ability, but his, your availability. He's chosen the weak things in this world, the despised things in this world, to, to conform to his image. The, the weaker we are, the more he can use us, I think. The less I am, the more Christ can be in us. pastor was speaking last weeks about remembering, remembering, calling to mind what the words of Christ are. He wants us to, to recall to a call to remember. How can we be conformed unless we do not remember? Remember Christ's words, remember the life, the love, the transforming power of Jesus Christ in our lives to stir our hearts, as Pastor says, is mixing with faith, to grow in, in love and in humility, to serve one another. It, our pastor's jobs are to stir us up, to remember God's word of doctrine, to teach, to teach us, not to be tossed to and fro, to be reminded often, to remember, to remember the truth of God's word, to draw near, to come to him in prayer, through intercession, to it, by interceding for others, that we also can be uh, in his presence. It's a, just a, it's a call to remembrance. These things that uh, it says in, it says that in Second Peter two one through nine, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see it far off. And, and it's, it's hard enough to see in this world, but without the Word of God, it's, 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 it's almost impossible. It is impossible without faith. So we, we come this morning to be stirred up, to be conformed into His image, to come in faith and to, uh, to be stirred up, to remember, to know that more of Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in us. To have that transformation power by faith, by the living Word of God, the seeds of God's word, the seed of God. It's, it's all about the word of God, and the seed is the word, and it comes into our hearts, and it's able to produce after its kind by faith and by believing and through prayer and by spoken and by remembering and recall and have it in our hearts. There's, well, I was listening to a message. It was spoke to me because sometimes I've, I've been thinking I'm in ministry for a long time, 30, 40 years, and... Are we, am I still on the milk of word? Am I still on the milk of God's word? Am I growing? And, and, am, I, and am I am I learning? I think so, but I don't know. <laughs> you know, you know, I don't want to know myself. I want to, I want to be able to to hear the message. We want to be able to hear the message to carry this word out to others, and to go into the deeper waters. And the only way we can get into the deeper waters is understanding the milk of the word, the, the sincere word of God, that takes us through the the. The, by the Holy Spirit to Christ Jesus through the cross and the resurrection and, and, the, and faith. And that's, that's, it's the word of God that does all this, not by trying to drum it up by faith, and not by, by just allowing the simple faith as a Christ, as, as he says, as children come to him. He makes it easy for them, easy for children to understand. We can make things complicated. I make things complicated. And uh, God's word is not complicated. It's in simple things is love and, and that allow that love to to stir us up, to walk deeper waters, to be transformed, and take take that message to all the world. And that's the Great Commission, to follow me, to come first. We have to first come, as we are this morning, and then to follow. And the following is, is serving. Following is given the love of Christ by faith. It's just the Word. It's the Word. It's just the Word. It's, it's not to speak. It's, it's the Holy Spirit with the anointing. It has to be anointed. Anybody can, anybody can speak the Word of God, but without the, the anointing, without the faith, it's just, it's not, it's not going to be powerful. It's not going to be productive. It won't, won't to produce fruit, perhaps. You know, no one knows the word after it is spoken. Only God, only God can really, we have discernment, 
but we want to come by faith and knowing that our pastor has a message for us all and we all come expecting and Christ always delivers a message and he reveals a word special for us this morning. Each time we're in his word, he, there's a revelation, something new, something fresh. I may have heard it 10 times, but it's new again, it's fresh again, it's a powerful and it conforms us and it's deep and it's holy. So that's why this church, that's why the, the word of God will never, never pass away, never fade away. So we're just so thankful that uh, this morning, Father God, that you can stir our hearts again, Lord. Lord, do a mighty work in our lives, Father God, through the power of your word, the power of the resurrection and the cross, Lord, the cross and the resurrection, Lord, through love. Yes, Lord. Thank you for each person here, and thank you for prayers, and thank you for our pastors that uh, spend time and messages to give the, your, the sheep, us, Father God, your children, to walk in this world and to, to see clearly, to remember and recall <laughs> the fullness of Christ, God. It's so beautiful that you're doing amazing work in our lives through faith and just and by your word and coming to you as children, Lord. So we thank you for all these things and everyone here and those who are in our hearts and our prayers and those who are not feeling well, Lord, and all of the different situations that are going on in the world who are hurting and who are lost and who are handicapped, just the different calamities and that seem to uh, entangle us, Lord, but you bring us comfort and peace. You never give us more than we can't handle. So we was just so thankful for your love and your grace and your holy words, Lord. Thank you for this morning's message that you have for us, and we believe this in faith. In Christ Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, just four announcements. Um, we are going to uh, do something with the kids uh, during spring break. Um, we're hoping that we can do something fun for our little ones. And then we have, have about 15 children or young men and women. And we'd like to take them to Olita Park and do some kayaking uh, with them. And for that, we're going to um, perhaps make it a fun day, but at, at the same time, something where they can learn, uh, again, remember what we do in the church uh, as far as evangelism is concerned. So we're hoping and we're going to be planning with the pastors and then the um, Bible study ladies so we can see what we can do for them. But in order to do this, we'd like your help and assistance. And the children have heard and they agreed to do a bake sale. So starting Sunday, next Sunday that is going to be coming up, uh, we're going to be doing a big sale for the children. So um, bring singles, uh, little cash in order to support them. So as much as they can raise, or in 20s, <laughs> well, bring 20s, but bring singles too, so we can give change back, okay? <laughs> um, but I think it's going to be fun for, for them. And they, would, they want to have as many activities as possible in the church and where they learn about God, but at the same time, that they have relationships with each other. So when they get older, whether they go to college or high school and uh, where they're not really directly involved with God, but they remember those moments and they remember those things uh, that can bring them back to God. So we're doing this. Uh, so help us support uh, that vision that we have for our children. Um, we want them to be ingrained in God. And then they also are going to become uh, evangelists in the future, in their church, in wherever they go, in schools, wherever. So help us do that. Uh, we need your support. In, and so we're planning that for them as a way, uh, again, uh, for the whole spring break. I know that they're going to be home. So let them, let us do something with them and let them be reminded of God and that God also has a fun part to him as well. So Sunday, next Sunday, the following Sunday, we're going to do as many big sales as possible so we can raise some funds for them. And we have about 15 of them, as I said. Um, yes. Uh, the next thing, you know that we have the Women's Bible Study every Monday at 7 p.m. If you are not able to make it to Miss Sharon's house, you can get the Zoom link from Miss Christy. Raise your hand so they can see you. You can uh, approach her. And then Wednesday night service is at 7 p.m. And we are doing evangelism, uh, Bible school, Bible college, right? Um, and then so be there. We also love to have you there to learn about God and continue to know him in a way uh, that is structured and that you know uh, God's love for you and God's love for humanity. 
And then on Saturday at 10 a.m., we have our prayer as well as this Saturday, right? We have outreach. This Saturday coming up, we have outreach. So uh, be here. Uh, if any, if you cannot go out, come here to pray. And if you're not able to come to pray, pray for those who are going out and then um, link in with all of us. And um, and I believe that's it. And then for visitors, would like to see first time visitors. You don't have to stand up. You can raise your hand. Hello. I'm <laughs> happy to see you. All right. Praise God. We welcome you. And if you haven't received a little bag yet, did you receive a little? Thank you. So just write your name uh, and then put it back in the um, in the young lady back there as well. So we welcome you and we hope that you come back and then uh, so you can know more about what God has for you. OK, thank you. Bye bye. Can we uh, pass out the elements for uh, communion, please? Um, I want to read this for you before we start while Chris is doing that. This is, um, thank you. This is from Myra to me. And as you know, we've been praying for Marlena. And, um, you know, God hears your prayers. God hears your prayers. Listen to this. It says, good morning, honey. She called me honey. But then later on, she said, I didn't mean to call you honey, Pastor. That was intended for Mirtha. So she had to write that to me, too. Okay, anyway, I was feeling good for a while. No, um, so um, Marlena went to the doctor this morning. Her blood levels are back to normal. She has had to be on antibiotics pills for three to six months. The doctor asked her how much paperwork she did she do to get those pills at no cost. He said that pill is very hard to get, and he has patients that have been on IVs for over six months, and when they got approved, they still had to pay $5,000 a month. No charge, $5,000 a month. And, um, and, and then Myra says, and then I just went to Marlene and said, Jesus loves you. And, and that's amazing. That's a, it just encouraged me. That's such a, God, God hears prayers. God hears our prayers. Yeah, praise God. So very, uh, very encouraging. All right, so uh, communion um, uh, before we do our message. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is dealing with the church that is very arrogant and very proud in the way God has blessed them. And, um, and so he deals with them, and he deals with them even through communion, by the way. And, um, and two times, he came to them and told them, he says, listen, you, you are a church that thinks they deserve a lot of praise. And he says, I praise you not. Twice. Two different times. It's like, he, he was saying in this, he says, so in communion, which is a symbol, he said, you are, that should be used as a time to worship and praise God, but you're putting it all on yourselves. So don't come to me and look for praise because what you're doing, he said, very, very, uh, very bold. He says, what you're doing, you are, you are causing division amongst each other. You're boasting that you have something more than somebody else. And, and that's a teaching of what is called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, 
Gnosticism is still rev- relevant today, by the way. It's, it, and, and it's very subtle, and nobody speaks of it. But what it does is it promotes one, spiritual, one person's spirituality above another. Like, I'm greater than you because I'm the pastor. I'm greater than you because, I'm, you know. And, and, and he goes, it's nothing but division, and I'm not going to praise you. And you are really partaking of the Lord's Supper unworthily. Just to think you can come up, you know, communion is to, for us to reflect uh, our lives that, you know, we are, we have been called out of sin and we have been sanctified, have been sanctified. Um, a, a setting apart by God. God has set you apart, has taken you out of sin and placed you into the light of his marvelous son. This is the remembrance. Uh, Steve was talking about remembrance, and we're going to still be on that today too, by the way. But um, do we remember? do we remember what Christ did for us? when we were sinners. So communion takes us out and brings us into a worship and glorifying God for what he's done in my life. Not a boasting, not a bragging, not none of that. It's, it's humility. So in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. It says, uh, in, uh, he says, the Lord Jesus in the, the B part, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he gave thanks, he said, take it, eat this, is my body, which will be broken for you. And then there it is, that again, he says, this is done in remembrance of me, to remember what Christ did. That's amazing. So partake of the body. Boy, those crackers are terrible, ain't they? I'm sorry, Lord. Those are bad. <laughs> Sawdust. <laughs> terrible. Verse 25, in the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this is the cup of the New Testament. And I love that. And remember, we talked a couple weeks ago, when there's a change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law. Wow. That's why we're not under the law. There's a change in the... Jesus was not from the tribe, the Levitical priesthood. He was from the tribe of Judah. There had to be a change in the priesthood. And when there's a change in the priesthood, there's a change in the law. This is the New Testament. He says, and that New Testament is formed formed and regulated in my blood that was shed. And Kelly did an amazing prayer on that blood. We, we are not familiar with the blood that was shed. It covered, it was for the sins of the world. It's the only reason why I have life today. It's because of the blood. He said, so, uh, so as often as you drink, do it in remembrance of the blood that was shed. Partake of the blood. All right, so give them praise. That's communion. That's communion. Nobody's going to be praised. Wow. All right. You guys ready today? What did we teach about last week? Just raise your hand if you know. What did I preach last week? Raise your hand. Anybody to remember, and we didn't. <laughs> yeah, S- Steve talked about it too, yeah, but it's good. Um, memory. Uh, the Satan, Satan wants to, to remember too. He brings a lot of things to your remembrance, your past. 
Yeah. Second Peter, we're in. And we're, gonna, we're doing a line upon line. If you didn't listen to last week, listen, because it will give you, uh, you, you'll be like right in the middle of this. And Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for the body of Christ, for communion, the communion of the saints. Communion in its name means unity. And Paul's saying, listen, there's division <laughs> among you. Let nothing be between us. Nothing but Christ. Okay, so um, we'll pick it up in, in verse 3. Um, that's what we covered last time. I'm just going to read this. I'm not going to go over it. We'll go right into 4. It says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. That's where we ended last week. And, um, and we're seeing that in the world today. Many people... Uh, coming around and uh, walking after their own lusts. Um, I want to think, uh, as, as we get into this, I want to, again, for us to think about that word, remembrance. Because if we can't remember his promises, we are defeated before we even started. There is no victory for a Christian who cannot live in the promises of God. I can't, I can't live in my own ability. I can't live in my own strengths. But I can live in the promises. The promises is what gets me over the temptations and the trials of life that every believer goes through because it produces patience. You know, God wants to produce patience in your life. How's that going? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a great topic to think about. Um, Turn, um, before we get going, turn to um, Lamentations. Chapter 3. And this book was written by Jeremiah. The prophet of God that would preach and preach and preach and no one would listen to him. You guys talk and talk and talk and feel like nobody's listening? Maybe it's you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's incredible. But that, that was Jeremiah. And, and Jeremiah was um, falsely accused. And... Um, put into captivity. And, you know, when things like that happen in your life, when all these things come upon your life, you start to get bitter. I'm bitter at people. I'm bitter at the surroundings. I'm bitter with my job. I'm bitter with my husband. I'm bitter with everything. Everything in life makes me bitter because trouble is being poured upon trouble. And this is what was happening to Jeremiah in verse 19. Look at this. And remember, we're talking about remembering. And not just remembering. Remembering is a form of recalling. Bringing things up to my mind that I have been taught by God. And sometimes it's a hard thing. Because Satan wants to block that. And it's funny how we can remember our past and we, we can remember our sins, but we cannot remember the promises of God. So look at, because of the problems that Jeremiah is going through, look at this verse. He says, remembering my afflictions and my misery and the wormwood and the gall. This is what he remembered. He's remembering his afflictions. He's remembering his misery. That was, that was controlling his life at this moment. My afflictions, I'm being afflicted and I'm innocent. You know, Jeremiah, Jesus, you know, they never defended themselves in being right. You know, but sometimes we think we have to. Do you have to defend somebody? Do you have to, I mean, I know people that defend other people. It's not even themselves. They defend, you know, just 
maybe family. I give an excuse for everything. That's defending. When I, when I have to give an excuse because they need to know. Jeremiah didn't say nothing. Jesus opened not his mouth. Could he have defended himself? <laughs> yeah. But my afflictions and my misery, the word here, wormwood and gall are the same. They mean bitterness. I remember my bitterness. This is this little teeny worm that just eats right through wood and then produces and it just goes all over again. And, and it, it destroys the, the content of it. But, it. but it means in the Hebrew, it means bitterness. And, and this is what he's saying, remembering that. And bitterness fills people's hearts. It fills my heart. And it settles there. And um, even though I can ask for forgiveness and think I'm away from it, when something reoccurs that reminds me of that again, I'm right back to being bitter again. That quickly. Bitterness is one sneaky thing that just stays there and waits for an opportunity to spring forward and make you misery, make you miserable, wreck your entire day because you're bitter. Because bitterness lies within our hearts, you know. And in troubled times, it's very easy to get bitter. Because it's so easy to be bitter. I can be bitter about the economy. I can be bitter about the politics. I can be bitter about the president. I can be better, bitter about the way the world's going. And it just leads from one thing to another. And I'm bitter in life. I'm bitter in life. My heart is heavy because of bitterness. And I live in the past and I live in the hurt and the pain because of bitterness. Um, verse 20. It says, look at this. My soul has still in remembrance and is humbled in me. So my soul is remembering these things very easily. The parts of my soul, because bitterness and feelings are tied with our emotions. It's an emotional response to something that has happened. And it's causing a lot of other problems. It's afflicting me. These, this affliction in the Old Testament speaks of even sickness and disease and worry and fear. It's all related. It's all tied into one another. And it's just misery. And I can't stop, forget, I can't forget it. It's always in my remembrance. My soul is bringing it up over and over and over. And I'm just reliving the same thing that happened five years ago. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and I'm living in that. The soul is very good at bringing the past into your future and saying, here, feed on this. It's, it's Isaiah where it says to feed on ashes. Feed on something that's worthless. Feed on something that has no value. That's my diet. And I carry it with me. And what I carry with me eventually will come out. And it will never be positive. It will always be negative. Because that's my life, bitterness. Remember in the uh, book of Ruth? Her name was Naomi. And she lost her husband. And she lost her sons. And she says, don't call me Naomi no more. Which speaks of... Uh, joyful and happiness and, and you know, bubbly over. But instead, call me Myra. Yeah, which means bitterness. Call me that because that's my feeling. That's what I'm living in now. And, it, and, and here's the thing. She, she claimed, listen, you need to call me that. But if you read through the book, Ruth doesn't and Boaz doesn't. 
Others could call her that, but the, the two characters that mattered in that book kept on calling her Naomi. Because God sees you who you are and not how you feel. You might feel like you're in bitterness, but that's not who you are. So, verse 21, and look at what Jeremiah says now. He says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Now he's going to recall, and recalling is a type of remembrance. And what is he going to now that's going to recall that's going to give him hope? Because this is what this is talking about. Something, the Holy Spirit brings things to our remembrance. The Holy Spirit brings things to our remembrance. And I'm going to start to recall things that I've heard that God has said about me. I want to I wanna dwell upon and think about and recall what God has shown me and has taught me. And I don't care if you've been a believer for a week, a year, five years, ten years, or like Steve said, you know, recalling of what you've learned is probably the most important thing for a believer because you're going to have trials. And what can we recall? Are you going to depend upon your own strength to get you out? Are you going to take a, a shovel and dig yourself out of the miry clay? Or are you going to have a promise from God? God's promise. This is recall. This is proper recall. And it happens. Recall needs to happen every time the enemy shoots something into your mind that you're saying, where did that come from? What is that? And those are thoughts of depression, thoughts of loneliness, fear, anxiety, stress, bitterness, all of them. We are to cast those thoughts down. They are not from God. They are from the enemy. And, and you know what? Before you were saved, those thoughts never came into your mind. Because he already had you. Satan already had you. He didn't have to. But now that you're his, now he's got to go after your past. He can only attack your past. He can only attack when you fail. He's got, he's, Satan's not going to come to you and say, wow, that was a glorious day the day you got saved. He ain't going to bring that up. He's going to talk about your past, your failures, how you failed. That's the only thing he can bring up. That's what he wants to bring to your remembrance. But Jeremiah, who has been with God for so long, has this amazing um, uh, source that is within his heart. And it's called the Word of God. And he goes, these are the things I'm going to bring to my mind. It, it's the same verse that says, think on these things. You know, we have a choice on what we are to think about. You want to you want to you want to deal with you want your mind polluted and and distorted. Stay on Facebook and look at all that crap all day long. Watch what starts to come out. Watch what you start to think about. You'll start thinking of something that you've seen three days ago there. So think on things above. This I recall. And when, when I recall God's word, it automatically gives me hope. Hope is something everybody searches for. But you know what? It, it, it's, it's, it's not a make-believe hope. You know, it's nothing like this is what is This is more a reality than the chair you're sitting on now. This is this type of hope. Now look what he says in verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. So what Jeremiah brings up is God's mercies. This is what he recalls. To think about, wow, God has given me mercy. I'm in a prison. God has given me mercy. This is really what his thought is. But if, if, but if it isn't for his mercies, I'm already judged. I'm already consumed. Because I'm guilty. I deserve judgment. But no, he says, God has instead given me mercy. Instead of judgment, mercy triumphs over judgment. It's a beautiful thing. 
And, and, and because his compassions fail not, so it's because of the Lord's mercies that I'm not consumed because his compassions don't fail. God is compassionate with us. This is what I'm recalling. God's got great love for me. This is what I'm recalling. And that compassion turns to mercy. Because God has extended mercy and compassion towards me instead of judgment and death. He's given me mercy and compassion. And it says that those compassions fail not. And in the, in the Hebrew, this fail not means it's not even prohibited. It's not even prohibited for God not to have compassion. <laughs> There's no such thing as not, no compassion for God. Even his judgment is righteous. His judgment is righteous. He has a righteous judgment for those that will reject him. It's still a righteous judgment. He's done all he can to save them and to give them and extend mercy into their life. And then 23, that those same mercies, those same mercies that I am bringing to my recall, and it's the same mercies that are giving me hope, and they give me hope when? Every morning. Every morning, His mercy is new. I can have a new hope every morning. This is the abundance life of a believer that gets to take a step out into the world that you have no idea what's happening. And we do it, you know, we do it like just familiar. We just go. But you know what? If you're not going with His mercy that morning, it's, it's like going into the battlefield without the armor of God. You're, you're fully exposed. You're fully wide open. But those mercies are new every morning. The mercies, the promises of hope. This is what I bring to my recall. This is what I remember. And, and I can remember them. And I can recall other verses in the Bible only because the second part, God is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. I can, uh, I can approach every situation because God is faithful to me. He's not leaving you alone to deal with all this bitterness in life. He's not dealing, he's not telling you, oh, you've got to deal with your own problems and your own bitterness. No, that is being put there by different things and we are to get rid of them and recall to my mind the mercy of God. This is why I have hope. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. All right, so let's, where are we? Okay, 2 Peter 3. Let's get, let's see how many we get here today. Probably not a lot. I didn't even start. All right, so we ended with verse 3, right? And just read that to yourself. And it says, knowing this first. And what that means, knowing this first means remember this. Remember this first. That in the last days, and remember there are four things that Peter said to remember. Number one, remember that Christ is coming back. And remember, this group here in Peter was under the attack and they were fleeing for their lives. They, they've just lost their homes, their families, all their belongings, all their possessions. They've lost everything. And Nero is putting the attack and the blame of the fire that happened in Rome on the Christians. So they are under heavy persecution. And in that, he says, listen, know these four things. Know, number one, that Christ is coming back. Number two, for a short period of time, and this is where we're at now, Remember, in, in, those, in these last days, there's going to be false teachers. And those false teachers, you can tell them who they are because they're going to, they're going to de de deny that he's coming back. So he's coming back, and there's the other group that's going to deny that he's coming back. And then the third thing he tells them to remember in this chapter is remember the day of the Lord, and we'll get to that. And the fourth thing he tells them to remember is remember God has a plan for you. 
And that's beautiful. You know, we are scattered, so to speak. We don't know what direction, but God has never left us. He's still with us, and he still has a plan for you. It's hard to see a plan in my life when I'm like on the run, trying to just preserve my, you know. But th- these are the promises of God. And I, I truly believe, because this was the end of Peter's life, um, and, and going forward, I think they were going to have to recall these things. Part of their recall would be these four things of remembrance. Um, and then we also talked about remember that the, you know, even though they've lost everything, and he says that in 1 Peter 1.25, the word endures forever. The word endures forever. The word, I mean, they're just amazing. Just to keep saying that, it's just amazing. Um, okay, so verse 4. So now these are the scoffers in the last day, those, those that mock, those that deny his coming, those, this is even part of the group, you know, in the same uh, settings that would follow Paul. After he would preach about grace, they would come right after him and preach about legalism. That was their job. Right after Paul, let's bring in another message. Let's bring in a message of death, you know. So, um, so Paul had to deal with them. They were the same types of group, mockers and, and those that were scornful, scornful. Scoffer, scoffers, 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 got it. Okay, now here's what they say, verse 4. In saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where's the promise? You know, you, we're talking about now how to live by the promises of God. Where are the promises? Where are they? Where are the promises of his coming? And then they said, and since the fathers fell asleep, which means all their parents and, and all things continue as they were like from the beginning this has been from the beginning they keep saying the same thing over but where are they where are the promises of god where are his promises and you know do you have promises this is the this is the teaching do we know the promises of god for my life has god given you a a word? Has he given you a verse? Has he made a promise to you? And, and, you know, there's over 6,000 of them in this book. We don't need many. We don't need many. Last week at the wrap, some people went around quoting their favorite promise, and that was wonderful. That's a wonderful thing to do. You know, um, but in this position you know where where are your promises turn let's let's look at um let me just give you one and um not a promise i'm i'm going to talk about his promise turn to john 14 verse 1 gospel of john 14 verse 1 let not your heart be troubled oh by the way that's a promise God's just giving you a promise. Especially if your heart has been troubled. Or or not if your heart. How about, has things in your life troubled you? How's that? Because they will, they will lead to your heart. They will settle in your heart. If you are allowing a lot of things around you to trouble you, it's just a matter of time where your heart's going to be very troubled. You're going to be living in the trouble. And, 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 and sometimes those things are hard to even overcome. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, here's another promise. There are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. And I go up, prepare a place for you. Now look at verse 3. And if, here's the promise. Here's the promise of Christ's coming. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. So beautiful. I'll come again. There's your promise. Christ has promised to come back for his people. 
He'll come back for his people. And I'm going to receive you unto myself. And that's where, wherever I am, you will be also. And that's, that's incredible. So there is, um, there is a promise for you. It's the promise of his coming. And, um, and in the, back in uh, 2 Peter, in that verse, he says, everything has been the same since, our, since the beginning of time, basically. Since the beginning of creation, nothing has changed. And, you know, you think about a statement like that. And God said, I sent the prophets to you. I sent, I sent my son to you. I sent my only son. And you rejected him and you mocked him. <laughs> and you scoffed at him and you crucified him. So I, I've done everything. But that's the, that's the, you know, that's part of the promise. You know, all, all in the Old Testament of the promises of the coming of the Messiah. And, and you're saying everything's been the same? How, how dull is your life? How, how motivated are you to face tomorrow? You know? Um, because we miss these small promises in our lives. And we become very familiar with the things of God. And familiarity will destroy us. Uh, even um, even Jacob, right before he's wrestling with God, he's he's sitting there and he said, and he, when he went, he says, God was in this place and I didn't even know it. He's familiar. We can be very familiar with God. We can be very familiar with one another. Yeah, it's it's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous game to be familiar. And um, so this is, this, they, they were familiar, they didn't even know. And to think that all things are the exact same as it was in the beginning, you're very shallow in your thinking. You're not, your mind's not opening. Search the scripture because they speak of me, Christ said. Just go ahead and search. Find it. Find, find Christ in the Bible. And let him speak to you. And let him give you a promise. Let him deal with you personally. Because he will. So, verse 5. You guys with me today? Okay. Verse 5. Look at this. So, he changes things now. Goes in a little different direction. For this they willingly are ignorant. Boy, what a statement, huh? By the way, you're, you're, you're very willingly ignorant. Which means you search to be stupid. No, I mean dumb or whatever. I mean, you look for things to embarrass yourself by. You know, what are you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but will, willfully, willingly, I'm wide open being an idiot or whatever, you know. That's, you're willingly are ignorant of, of, of that by the word of God. Look at this. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water. Six, whereby the world that, that then was being overflowed with the water perished. Verse seven, by the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. All right, so let's hit this, because there's a lot here. So in verse 5 and 6, so he's talking about a couple of different things. And how you want to separate these verses is this. He talks about the world that was and the world that is. So that's your separation. There was once a world that was, and that, that world world that was was overflowed by water to the extent where everybody perished or not i don't think it says everybody i think everything perished everything perished so this could be a meaning this could have happened before adam but i think it happened at the time of noah in genesis chapter 8 
Okay, so that's where, because everything there also perished. And there was judgment upon, uh, upon all of mankind and, and really upon the world. And everything, uh, everything perished. Okay? Uh, and, and it says that um, in verse 6, there by the world that was. So that was the world that was. It was overflowed with water. And then it, everything perished. Everything. Okay, so that's that's this this first part, Genesis chapter eight. You can read that. And then verse seven. Yeah, six we hit. Oh, huh? Six. Okay, Genesis six. Okay, um, verse eight, seven. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now, okay, so now there's this flip, by the exact same word, the same word that God destroyed everything, by that same word, are kept in store, reserved, right? Reserved unto fire. Now what that is talking about here is um so it says stored up stored up or unto but it also could mean stored with fire so that's the word the world was stored up is being stored with fire and this is not god raining down his judgment in fire uh, upon people at the uh, in this in, when it's talking here now there is there is a time where God's own judgment um, there's a fiery judgment in Revelations in um, Revelations 18, 19 and 20 talks about let's, let me hit just a couple of verses so you see this this is the final judgment upon man where there's the destroying of the world. God promised, though, in the flood that he would not destroy the world again until that time. So it's, it's two di- So this here, I think, is talking about during the time. So I'm going to show you what that is in a minute, but I want you to get this, because this is good. I, let me see if I can find something here. Yeah, okay, so... Yeah, 18, 19, and 20. Did I give you those? I think it's more in there. And you can read about these different judgments that are going to take place. But like one of the verses where Babylon Babylon is, is, will be judged, this um, great horror, the Bible calls it. Um, uh, let's do 18, where Babylon, Babylon is fallen. Yeah, you know, this is a very good, I'm not going to go in now because of time, but read all this, read it slow because it's amazing. It's amazing teachings. But um, look in verse um, four, it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people that have not partaken of her sins, that have not received her plagues. Look at verse five. For her sins have reached unto the heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This is the only time in the Bible where it says God remembers iniquities. I mean, He forgets ours. He removes ours as from the to. I mean, to a believer, He re, He He doesn't remember our sins because they've been all placed upon Christ. But here He's remembering the sins and the iniquities uh, of. Of Babylon, and 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 then it says, "Reward her, even as she rewarded you, the double, unto her double according to her works." So, um, I, the word "double" here uh, in the Greek it, it it just me- means the fullness. So they're going to be the fullness. They will be judged fully. 
Yeah, the full, right. It's the fullness of that judgment upon them. The day of judgment for, for their sins. Remember, believers are not judged according to their sins. Believers are judged according to believe. Do you believe in Christ or you do not? Because our sins have been paid for. Past, present, future. Upon the cross of Christ. There is no wrath for the sin of the believer. But there will be a wrath for the unsaved. And those who reject Christ. Who do not believe in him. Um, and we can talk about that in the rap if you need to see verses. John 16. So, okay, so double, double, which is a fullness of judgment, will be poured upon, upon this evil. But that's not what this is speaking about in, um, in Peter here. This is speaking of what, what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing in, in the study part of this. So, um... So yeah, no one, nobody else will judge the earth. Um, and verse ten uh, in in Second Peter three. Don't put that up because we're going to hit that. I don't know if we're going to get that, but that that's going to explain it all. And it's like the earth will judge its own. That's that fire that's that it's under. Um, and this is the time of the day of the Lord, which is. So we believe that the church will be raptured out in Revelations 2 and 3. And the reason why we believe that is because after chapter 3 in Revelations, there's no more talking of the church until the end. But it's all talking about the wrath of God. And then also, um, 1 Thessalonians 5, pretty clear verse this is in verse 19 remember in in chapter 4 the dead in Christ shall rise first those who those who remain or who those who are alive and remain will be caught up that word caught up is harpazo we're going to meet him in the clouds that word harpazo is rapture the rapture of the church so I think that takes place. And then you've got the seven years of the great tribulation. Don't mix that up when you see in the Bible where it talks about tribulation. Because when it's the great tribulation, it tells you. And all the everything will be poured on upon judgment upon the earth. And still during that time, many will be saved. Because God has a plan for His chosen people, Israel. And you'll have 12,000 from each tribe. 144,000 will become amazing evangelists in the world. But they'll go through this time. Including the two witnesses that will start it. But uh, that's going to be... <laughs> I, I think they're going to bring many to Christ. Many will come to Christ during that period of time. I think more than even the church age. Uh, just in that three and a half or seven year period, more will come to Christ. Um, but then it also says in verse 9, look at this. For God, had, now this is after what I just read you, caught up the harpazo, 5-9, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath. Pretty clear. But to obtain salvation by His Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the there is no wrath for the believer. The wrath for the believer was all put upon Christ. He took the wrath for you. That you don't need to go through this. This is why we teach that when He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That God turned away. Because he could not look upon sin that was put upon Christ. What a savior you have. What a savior. What a savior we got. Okay. So. Alright. So. Let's. Let me do one more verse. 
And then, because we're... All right. And I, 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 this is a great verse. And it's like, people think it's thrown in there, but it's really amazing. You know, try to think of the content that we've established already um, of, of what's going on. And now the, the heaven and the earth and the destroyed and the judgment and the, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not the rapture of Christ, but it's when Christ will return to judge the the nations that's the day of the lord okay because it talks about different days like that but the day of the lord is is not a this is the final judgment that's how it's looked the day of the lord will be the final judgment so verse 8 he says and beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as as one day. And it's like put in here, and it's like, you know, what is that in, you know? And it's, it's a, because people quote it, you know? I don't know if they're quoting it in content, but, <laughs> I mean, according to all this that is going on, but um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's destruction is taking place down here. This is destruction. And, um, and that's the day of the Lord. It's the period of time when Christ returns to the earth. And the great tribulation period. And it, he establishes his kingdom. This is the thousand year reign. A thousand years. So if you think about it, there's no destroying of the earth like we just read a little bit at this time. Because there's still a thousand and seven years more to go, according to the Bible. A thousand and seven years after, at the time that this starts. That's, that's amazing. So, and within this, this, is, this, there's great promises for the believer. We're talking about the promises of God. This is, this is an amazing promise for you. You know, the, the door, the window will be closed on grace very shortly. We call that the sixth dispensation period. There are seven dispensations in the Bible. We're in the sixth. I think we're at the far end of the sixth. It's only a seven-inning game. We're in, the la- we're, we, we're in the bottom of the six with two outs and th- two strikes on the batter, I think. It's not long. And at that time, that will close. And then the last dispensation will be the kingdom. So there's great promises. And one thing I learned about that is if reading this verse, one day... With the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day. And to me, that means God is just so long suffering that none should perish. None should perish. And He has a plan still with Israel. And um, a lot of Christians today uh, don't believe that. Um, and, and there's many false teachers that arise that, um, that claim that they're Israel. It's, it's all over the place. E- even based on color. There's a group here that they're there, the group there, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's crazy. It's crazy teaching. It's not biblical. It's not what the Bible is teaching us. You know, because people say, well, how is he going to get 12,000 from each tribe? How is he going to know all the different, you know, what tribe they're from? You don't think God knows that? (laughs) You know, you have to have everything laid out, you know, and know, you know, because the Jews have been scattered throughout the whole world. So this is, that's why they say, "How, how would you know what tribe you're from? Because God knows their DNA. God knows everything about them. 
He knows what tribe they're from. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the foolishness of man with, without the Spirit of God. And you claiming to be wise, you would become fools. So, God will be long-suffering. He'll be patient. Not rushing to things. Time is not a factor with God like it is with us. By the way, Myrtha, in about 14 hours, you got to get up to go to work. <laughs> but, but no, there is no time. Time is nothing for God. He's waiting to be patient. He's long-suffering. You know he was so patient with you? Think about how old were you when you got saved? How old were you when he finally called you? Look how much damage you did to your life before he called, <laughs> you know? We made a mess of ourselves. And, and he called us. He called us with, uh, with an amazing love. But he's long-suffering. He's patient. He's gentle. No, no factor, no time. Just waiting for them to come to him. And he's with open arms. But don't don't get me wrong. He's he, there. Will the judgment is coming? <laughs> judgment is coming like the world has never seen before. It's a judgment that will be the end of all judgments. There will be no other judgment after this. After the thousand year, there will be a destruction of the earth, and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, because the old will be done. Not that any should perish. And the invitation to God is still to come. Even all through this time, it'll still be an invitation to come unto me. Always. And that's amazing. And, and, and he's waiting. He's just waiting and waiting and waiting. Not pushing people. Not forcing them, you know. No slamming on, you better do this or none of that. Drawing them by his love. It's incredible. It's an incredible thing. But coming is always an invitation to salvation. Come and follow me, John 15. I mean, it's always just an invitation to follow Christ and to come after him. Come unto me and I will no wise cast you out. An invitation to come, an invita invitation to receive, invitation to be part of the body of Christ, to be saved and to have your sins washed away, to be given, to become a new creation where old things are passed away and everything now is all new. And, and we can live, believe it or not, we can live in this newness of life because of what Christ has done. But uh, but, he, but he's looking that none would perish. John chapter 6. So what amazing God we serve. Keep things in remembrance. Bring things to remembrance. Remember that he has saved you. And he's delivered you from the wrath to come. That's incredible. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, you have a plan for your people. And everybody's going to come against that plan and mock and scoff and deny it and laugh at you. And uh, all of this is going to happen. But God has given you promises. Promises of hope. Promises of love promises of eternity. And I just want to pray for those that need healing today. Um, we know that uh, Sister Sharon fell and what did she do? Crack her head open or something? So, so we want to pray for her. Others need healing within the body of Christ. 
Lord, you said you sent your word to heal. And you're a, you're a, you heal your people, Lord. Continue to work on us. Continue to heal and minister. Continue to draw us to you. Thank you, Father. We love you. We thank you, God.